Welcome. My name is Tim. I'm one of the pastors here at Cinderbrook Church of Christ, and we are so glad that you are here with us today, that you are taking the time to connect with us and to hear this message, and hopefully this message brings hope and encouragement to you as you continue your walk in faith. There are two things we are about as a church. We are about connecting together and about bringing hope to the world around us, sharing love and serving people around us. Um, so today, we want to connect with you, and we ask that you fill out a connection form and let us know what's going on in your life, if we can pray for you, if there's anything going on that you need help with, um, or just to simply say, hey. Um, so if you could, fill out that connection form. It's on our website, and it's on our app. Um, the other thing is that we want to be about bringing hope. And that's what this message is about. This message is about God fights for us. And we have hope in a God that is anchored and that is secure and it is so good. And we want to share that love with those around us. So again, this message is about bringing hope and that God fights for us. And it's in Joshua chapter 10. So if you're going to be watching this, I ask that you go ahead and open your Bibles and be ready um, with your Bible in the chapter of 10 in, in the book of Joshua. The other thing I want to remind you about before we begin the message today in the worship is that we have three ways to give. You can give online, you can give in person, and you can give by texting this number that's up on this slide. Before we begin worship, I want to take a quick moment and pray for us. Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to be together, for this opportunity to worship, for this opportunity to hear your word. Lord, I pray that you'll be preparing our hearts for the words and the moments that you have prepared and are bringing to us in this time. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. is 
Hey, welcome back. I'm so glad you've chosen to gather with us again today. And, you know, whether you're gathering with us online or whether you're gathering with us in person here in the room or one of our services, I just want you to know that I'm thrilled that you've taken time to gather together with us. And as always, my prayer, uh, my hope is that by gathering together, you're actually able to connect with Jesus, to hear from him and to grow in your relationship with him more and more each and every day. That's always my prayer. You know, we're in this series in the book of Joshua entitled Courage Over Fear. And we're looking at this Old Testament book of Joshua and we're learning how it was Joshua who took the leadership reign of the nation of Israel following the death of Moses. And if you've ever spent any time in leadership, if you've ever been in leadership of any time, shape, or form, you understand that leadership comes with challenges. And Joshua was no different. There were a variety of challenges that Joshua experienced as he stepped into the leadership role of the nation of Israel. I mean, one of the challenges he would have would be following in the footsteps of Moses. I mean, one of the greatest leaders of all time, who wants to follow in the footsteps of Moses? And that would have been a huge challenge for Joshua. You know, another challenge that he would have experienced would have been leading the nation of Israel into battle, and leading them into battle and conquest of the land. And while God had promised to give them this land, they still had to go and to take possession of it. And that would have been a challenge for Joshua as well. But I think of all the challenges that Joshua would have faced as leading the nation of Israel, it would have been this one. It would have been encouraging people and reminding them to trust God, to trust God, to learn to trust God daily and to walk in his promises because by trusting God, they were going to be victorious over the battles that they were facing. You know, the book of Joshua, I'm, I'm loving this study in the book of Joshua, and the book of Joshua is growing on me, and the reason I love it so much and the reason we're studying it is because the book of Joshua really is a roadmap for us of how we can find victory in the battles that we face each and every day. See, just like God's children, the nation of Israel, they had promises coming to them. They had an inheritance coming to them, and that inheritance was the land. You and I have an inheritance as well today. And while our inheritance is not land, our inheritance is every spiritual blessing and promise of God. And yet, just like the nation of Israel, we've got to walk in faith and trust God to claim victory and to claim those promises. And just like the nation of Israel, this, this walk, this journey is going to bring battles to us. And you and I, we face battles each and every day, don't we? You know, we face battles with worry. Battles with anxiety, battles with uh, temptation, battles with sin, battles with anger. And all along, we want to be victorious over these battles, don't we? You see, we know that the Christian life is meant to be a life lived in victory, not in defeat. And so winning these battles is of utmost importance. But here's the problem. If you're like me, a lot of the times these battles come, and there are times where we experience more defeat than we do victory. You know, in a battle with worry, oftentimes we get defeated and we find ourselves worrying constantly, even though we know we shouldn't, but yet we continue to find ourselves in this spot and we wonder and we ask, will we ever be able to get beyond that? Are we ever going to experience victory over worry? Or maybe your battle is with anger and you're asking that question, is this just who I am? Am I constantly going to be defeated by this battle with anger? Or is there ever going to come a day in time when I'm going to be able to move beyond that and to find victory over anger? You see, a lot of times when we experience defeat and defeat and defeat instead of victory, we at times are tempted just to kind of resign ourselves to this fact and just to kind of give up on the battle and just kind of say this, I guess this is just who I'm meant to be. I guess this is what I'll always do and I'm not going to find victory over this, so I might as well just resign myself to the fact that this is my lot in life. I've got to be honest with you. There are battles that I have given up on. There are times that I have just resigned myself to this is who I am. You know, one such battle is a battle with my name. 
You know, ever since I've been able to talk, I have had to tell people what my name is. I've had to spell it for them, and yet people still don't get it because my name, Darren, is spelled so differently. A a month ago, I took my family on a charter fishing trip, and I had introduced myself to our guide, and about 30 minutes into the trip, he looked at me and he said, Daryl, are you going to fish? And I didn't argue with him. I just got up and went along with it, so I guess I'll always be Daryl. Uh, Just the other day, I was shopping in a store, and I went to give the salesperson my card so that they could uh, ring up my purchases and I could leave. And she looked at my card and my name, and she said this, Darren, that's a cool name. And my reply was just simply, yep, it is, isn't it? And I just went on. I have resigned myself to the fact that the battle with my name is a battle that I'm never going to win. But you know, as followers of Jesus... Giving up on these battles that we face each and every day, these spiritual battles, is not an option. It was like Vince Lombardi said, winning is not the most important thing. Winning is the only thing. And we need to be able to get to a place to where we can find victory over worry, where we can find victory over anger, where we can actually experience victory over temptation and sin and lust. we got to get to a place to where we can find victory over these battles. And I'm not sure what your battle is today that you're facing. I'm not sure what battle that you continue to trip up in and you continue to fall. But whatever your battle is, I want you to know this. God has a way for you to find victory. And the answer for you in the midst of your battle, the answer for me in the midst of my battle, is the same answer that God gave Joshua in Israel those many years ago. And what God says to you today is this. Trust me. Trust me. If you want to experience victory in life over the battles we face daily, You've got to learn to trust God. And the more you learn to trust God, the more victory you're going to experience. And you might even see God do the impossible and the miraculous in the midst of your battles. And that's what we're going to see in Joshua chapter 10 today. See, if you want to experience victory over the battles in life, then we need to look at Joshua chapter 10. And we're going to see how God wants to give us victory in spite of whatever odds and battle we may be facing. In Joshua chapter 10, if you got your Bibles, go there with me. Let me set the scene for you real quick, if you will. Remember in chapter 9, this nation of Gibeon came to Joshua by means of deception and tricked him into making a covenant agreement and a treaty with them. And so instead of driving Gibeon out of the land, Joshua entered into a treaty with them and made peace with them and allowed them to live amongst them. And the Gibeonites became the water carriers and the woodcutters for the temple of the Lord. When news of this treaty reaches the other nations around, everybody gets mad and war is declared on Gibeon. Look at it with me here in verse 1. It says, Now when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it, doing to Ai and to the kings as he had done to Jericho and his kings, and then he heard that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and were living near them, he and his people We're very much alarmed at this. Do you see what's happening here? Once Adonai Sedek, the king of Jerusalem, understands that Gibeon has now entered into a treaty with Jerusalem or with with Joshua and Israel, when he sees what Israel and Joshua have done to Ai and to Jericho, and now they've joined forces with Gibeon, he's very much alarmed. Why is he alarmed? Well, verse 2 tells us that he is alarmed because Gibeon was an important city. Gibeon was in a strategic location in Canaan. And it was vitally important to be able to have Gibeon to protect the rest of Canaan. Once Gibeon fell, the rest of the land would fall like dominoes. Gibeon was an important city, but more than that, they had mighty men there who were well trained for battle. And so what has just happened is this important city with mighty soldiers who were trained for battle have just joined forces with Joshua and Israel. And so King Adonai Sedek of Jerusalem realizes that he's in a bad spot now. And he knows that this alliance has been formed and that he will be powerless to stop it. And so what does he do in his alarm? Well, he makes a decision out of fear. And I don't need to tell you that whenever we make decisions out of fear, we normally make a bad decision. And so what he does is he grabs four other kings, four other cities, and they form their own alliance and they go to attack Gibeon. That's what he does, probably out of anger, out of bitterness, out of frustration, but mostly out of fear to try to sever this alliance between Gibeon and Israel. 
So look with me how Gibeon responds to this. In verse 6, Joshua chapter 10, verse 6, look what happens here. It says, the Gibeonites, they sent word to Joshua. Gibeon has been surrounded. And so what they do is they send word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal. Hold on to that, underline that. We're going to come back to Gilgal. And notice what the plea is. Do not abandon your servants. Come to us quickly and save us. Help us because the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. When Gibeon realizes that they're under attack, they rush to Joshua who is camped at Gilgal. Now we've seen Gilgal before. And as a matter of fact, the town of Gilgal, the city of Gilgal, becomes an important location in the book of Joshua. Remember with me, it was at Gilgal where where God commanded Joshua to, to make flint knives to go throughout the camp and circumcise all the males in the camp. And the reason for this is because they had neglected to circumcise them to fulfill this rite while they were traveling in the wilderness. And so it was at Gilgal that Joshua did the things that God called him to do, and the nation of Israel got right with God again. It was also at Gilgal where they celebrated the Passover for the first time in the Promised Land. And celebrating the Passover was all about remembering what God had done in the past. And so that remembering what God had done in the past, they could find the courage to follow God into the future. Gilgal became a place of remembrance, a place of reflection, a place of where things got right with God. And here's what you'll notice about Gilgal in the book of Joshua. The nation of Israel was anchored to Gilgal. As a matter of fact, every battle that they fought in the Canaan, in the Promised Land, was launched from Gilgal. Following every battle, following the victory of every battle, they returned once again to Gilgal, this place of remembrance, this place of reflection, this place where they got right with God. You know, if only today we as followers of Jesus had our own Gilgal, a place of remembrance, a place of reflection a place where we could be anchored to, to be reminded of the victory that God has brought us in the past so we can find the courage to follow him in the future. A place of remembrance where we can be reminded that we have been made right with God as well. (laughs) Wait a minute, you're right. We do have our own Gilgal, and our Gilgal is the cross. The cross of Jesus is our place of remembrance. It's our place of reflection. It's our place of being reminded that God has provided us victory over the power of sin, over the penalty of sin, and we are reminded that we have been made right with God. And just like the nation of Israel was anchored to Gilgal, this place of remembrance and reflection, if we want to find victory in our lives, we need to be anchored to the cross of Jesus. Be anchored to the cross of Jesus to be reminded that God has given us victory. Notice also in verse 6 the plea that comes to Gilgal. I find this so powerful. Gibeon, this powerful nation, they send this word to Joshua who is at a place of remembrance and they say, come and save us. They're overwhelmed by the enemy. Can you think of anything better to do in your own life when you're overwhelmed by the enemy and when you're facing the battles that you don't know how you're going to win? Can you think of anything better to do than to run to the cross? Run to the cross of Jesus. Be reminded of the victory that God has already given you. And in doing so, find the courage to follow him into the future. Word of Gibeon being under attack reaches Joshua at Gilgal. So what is Joshua going to do? Well, I think the natural temptation for Joshua would be to look at the situation and just say, hey, you guys came to me by means of deception. You tricked me into making a treaty with you, and so now you're getting what you deserve. So my advice to you would be prepare to defend yourselves because I'm off the hook now. I have nothing to do with this because you deceived me, and so you're getting what you deserve. So good luck. And in doing so, that mistake that Joshua made in chapter 9, could have been forgotten, could have been wiped out. But if you remember from chapter 9, in the day and time of Joshua, when you made a vow, when you gave your word, your word meant something. And it was not so easy to go against your word. As a matter of fact, to go against your word would bring shame and and reproach against not just you, but against your family, the community, and even the entire nation. So Joshua is not going to go against his word. So what's he going to do? 
Remember, he's at Gilgal, a place of remembrance and reflection. And we can infer by reading into the text here that Joshua actually took time to stop before he did anything, look to God in prayer, and listen for his leading. See, that's what got Joshua in trouble in, verse, in chapter 9, is he didn't take the time to stop and look to God and listen to him, and he launched out and made a big mistake. So maybe Joshua has learned from that mistake, and he says, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to pray to God. So what does God say to him? What does God hear from Joshua? Here's what I want you to notice in the text that Joshua does not hear. He does not hear God say, hey, this is your problem, not mine. He does not hear God say, you know what, Joshua, you wouldn't have been in this mess if you didn't mess up, so I'm just going to let you figure it out. You got yourself into this mess, you figure out how to get yourself out of this mess. You didn't want to involve me earlier, so I don't know why you want to involve me now. No, you're on your own. That's not what God said to Joshua. And as a matter of fact, if you have ever heard those words in the midst of your own battle, you're not hearing from God, you're hearing from the enemy. The voice of God is found in chapter 8 of Joshua 10, and this is what God says to him. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid. We've heard those words before in Joshua, haven't we? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. The reason that he is not to be afraid, as we see from chapter 1, is because God is with us. Isn't that amazing that even though Joshua did not turn to God in chapter 9 and he made this mistake, God did not abandon Joshua. God is still with him, and because God is with him, he need not be afraid of what is going to happen. He says, don't be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Notice the tense of this. This is in the past. God has already given Joshua victory. Don't be afraid of them. I've already given you victory none of them will be able to withstand you. I find that response of God amazing. Because even though Joshua messed up big time in chapter 9, God did not abandon Joshua. Even though Joshua made this huge mistake that has now complicated the entire situation, God is still at work to bring victory for his children. You know, I'm a baseball fan, and I'm a Cincinnati Reds fan, and anytime the Reds can beat the Cubs, I'm happy. And I go back several years ago to when the Reds uh, beat the Cubs in a walk-off home run that Barry Larkin hit off the relief pitcher Bob Patterson. And after the game, they asked Bob Patterson what the pitch was he threw to Barry Larkin. And this is how he described the pitch. He said it was a combination between a screwball and a changeup. I call it a screw-up. And I like that. And I tell you what, I can resonate with that. Because there's been a lot of times in my life that I have fit right there with Bob Patterson and I've thrown a screw up and I've messed up royally and I know that you have too. One of the lessons that we can learn from this is that our mistakes, our sins are not fatal, nor are they final. No, our sin will not separate us from the love that God has for us. If we can learn this lesson from the men and women who went before us, that when we mess up, when we sin, when we fail in battle, and we, and we just fall short of God's glory. We need not run away from God. No, we need to turn and run to God. And when we turn and run to God, we will experience his grace and his mercy and his love. And we'll realize this. Our mistakes cannot prevent God from doing his work. And so God tells Joshua, don't be afraid of them. I've already given them into your hands. And so here's what Joshua does. He sets on out on an all-night march, 20 miles, so that he can get to the enemy at daylight. Now, that doesn't make a lot of sense when you stop and think about it. You're going to march your soldiers 20 miles through the dark in order to attack the enemy at first light. By the time you get there, you're going to be worn out. The only way that makes sense is if you believe that God has already given you the victory. The only way it makes sense to march throughout the night is if you're actually trusting that God is going to do what he said he was going to do. And you know, just like Joshua marched through the night, I think there are times when we march through the night too, don't we? It seems like we're on this never-ending march through the night, and we just can't see where we're going. And we're not sure how we're going to get to the other side of this. Maybe you're in a season of that right now, and there is so much uncertainty about what tomorrow may bring, or what it may look like a month from now, or six months from now, and you just feel like you're closed in the dark, and you're not sure that you're going to be able to get to the other side. What do you do in that moment? 
Well, just like Joshua, you keep marching through the night, not focused on what you don't know, not focused on what you can't know, but being mindful of what you do know, that God is faithful and that God has promised to give you the victory. So you keep marching through the night and eventually you're going to find the victory that God has for you. I love what happens when Joshua gets uh, to Gibeon, and it says for us there that he surprised the enemy, that they weren't ready for this. In verse 10, when they get there, I want you to notice this. It says, the Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, and Israel was able to defeat them in a great victory at Gibeon. Did you catch that? When they caught them by surprise, God caused confusion, and they were defeated. And then we get down here to verse, uh, in verse 10, the bottom half of verse 10, that they began to turn and run away. And so Israel pursued them along the road as they were in retreat. But verse 11, as they were retreating before Israel on the road down from Beth Haran to Azekah, the Lord hurled huge uh, hailstones down upon them from the sky. While they're retreating, God caused a hailstorm to fall upon them. And the result of that hailstorm falling upon them is that more of them died from the hailstones than were killed by the sword of the Israelites. Do you see what's going on here? Do you see what's happening here? God throws them into confusion. They begin to retreat. God actually begins to rain down hailstones upon them. And notice the hailstones only hit the enemy. God is in heaven hurling down hailstones upon the enemy. He's got pretty good aim apparently. Because he doesn't hit one of the Israelites, he just hits the enemy. Notice in this battle, God threw them into confusion. God rained down hail upon them. It appears like God did the majority of the work. And isn't that the way it goes in battle? We have a God who always does the majority of the work to bring victory for his children. And then we get down to, in the midst of this battle, in verse 12 and 13, Joshua stops and he prays. As the enemy is retreating, the hailstones are falling upon them. Joshua prays and he says, Lord, make the sun stand still in the sky. In other words, extend the day. Give us plenty of light so that we can secure the victory in the battle completely. And we read on in verse 13 that it says, God caused the sun to stand still in the sky. God answered the prayer of Joshua, and as a result of that, they were able to complete the victory. God performed some miracles in that battle. He did the impossible. And for a lot of people, this verse, this passage of where God caused the sun to stand still causes a lot of problems. And a lot of people have used this verse to try to explain away the Bible and to try to show us why it can't be true and real, because this just doesn't happen. A lot of well-meaning followers of Jesus have actually tried to explain away this miracle and tried to prove it by different means. And while I enjoy reading some of those, I don't necessarily agree with them. Here's where I land on this miracle. If I believe Joshua, or if I believe Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, that God created the heavens and the earth, I have no problem with Joshua 10, verse 13. Because I'm reminded that God is outside of creation. He is not bound by creation. And we have a God who can and will do the impossible to bring victory to his children. Just read through the pages of scripture and you'll see how God is constantly doing the impossible. He gave a child to Abraham and Sarah in their old age. He allowed a boy by the name of David with five stones in a sling to defeat the greatest warrior of all time. He shut the mouths of the lions in the lion's den for Daniel. He protected Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego in that fiery furnace. He took the cross, an instrument of defeat and death, and turned it around to bring victory and life for us today. We have a God who specializes in doing the impossible. And if God can do the impossible, let me ask this question. What do we have to be afraid of? If we have a God who can specialize in doing the impossible to bring victory to his children, what do we need to be afraid of? The result of the battle there in, in the book of Joshua chapter 10, those who witnessed the battle that day came to this conclusion in verse 14. It was obvious that God was fighting for Israel. It was obvious that God was fighting for his children. 
And here's our takeaway from Joshua chapter 10. We need to be reminded in the midst of our battles that God fights for us, not against us. We have a God who fights for us to bring us victory, not against us. The question we need to ask ourselves is, am I fighting with God or or am I fighting against God? And the way we fight with God is we choose to trust him in his plan and walk in those promises each and every day. You know, the nation of Israel, they were anchored to Gilgal a place of remembrance, a place of reflection, a place where they were reminded that they were right with God and that God was fighting for them. And we need to learn from their lesson. We need to run to the cross in the moments of battle. We need to be anchored to the cross so that we can be reminded that God has already given us victory over our enemy. Our victory is secure. And we need to be reminded of that so we can find the courage to trust God and to follow Him into the future. I feel like I'm a nobody. Wonder if I'll ever amount to much. Seems like no matter what I do, it's never going to be good enough. Should I just give up? Lord, I need to hear you speak. Tell me I am loved. Tell me I am known that you died for me. I am not alone. You tell me I'm your child. The one your heart beats for. I can find. you guys enjoyed this time of worship that we've had together and the message that Darren brought. And I don't know about you guys, but I really enjoyed that imagery of God throwing those hailstones and fighting for his people. God fights 
for his people. He fights for us. At the end of the message, Darren also talked about how um, our, our hope that we have in, in God is anchored. Um, there's this passage that we find in Hebrews chapter 6 that says this. It says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Our hope is firm and our hope is secure. I learned something neat about this imagery of the, the anchor this week. I learned that, that for us, we use a cross a lot as an image and a reminder of what Jesus has done. The early church used an anchor as that reminder. It reminded them that their anchor was in God. Their anchor was what in Christ had done, and their anchor is firm, and their anchor was secure. And so today, I, I have two challenges for you as we move on from this day. The first is this. Where is your anchor? What is your life anchored in? That may be an easy question for you. You may say, my anchor is in Jesus. But if it is an easy answer, I want you to take a moment and just really think on it. Meditate on that and ask God to reveal to you maybe where you're not trusting that anchor, to where maybe you're trusting yourself over him. And if your anchor isn't in Christ, I want to encourage you to, to let us know, to, to, to send us a message, to contact us. You can send us a message through this number, 740-240-6924. Just shoot us a text and say, hey, I want my life to be anchored in Jesus. And we'll respond and we would love to have that conversation with you. And the second challenge is this. We have this hope that is an anchor for our souls. What are we doing to share that hope? How are we sharing that hope to our neighbors? This is, these are crazy times that we live in. And what are we doing to love and to serve and to share that hope to those around us? And so what we want to challenge you to do this week is to think about where your anchor is and to think about what you can do to share that anchor, to share that hope, to, sh to serve and to love those around you. These might be times when you're, you're stuck at home, but you still have neighbors around you. Maybe these are times when you're stuck at home, but you still have a way to communicate with people and to share love and to serve them. And so we want you guys to take, take this week and to, to brainstorm and to think about some ideas and some ways that maybe you can serve those around you. And we'd love to hear those. Again, shoot this number a message um, or contact us on Facebook. Send us an email. Let us know because we would love to partner with you in whatever ways that God is revealing to you that we can serve those around us. Let's pray as we close out this time. Lord, I thank you that you are our anchor, that I don't have to trust myself and whatever I can do to anchor myself, but that you are the anchor for my soul. In these times when everything seems to be thrown about and tossed about, Lord, we can trust that our anchor is firm and secure in you. Lord, I pray that you will reveal in us areas that we are not trusting you. That you will reveal in us areas that we are holding on to and areas that we need to let go and give to you. And Lord, I also pray that you will give us eyes to see those around us who need your love, who need that hope. And that you will give us ways that we can serve them and share that hope with them. And it's in your son's name we pray.